All right, hello everybody. Hello, hello. I see already folks are tuning in, checking in on the chat. Thank you so much. Welcome to the Interplanetary Winter Transmission Webinar. Next slide. Uh, my name is Jessica Rousset. I'm the Deputy Director here at ASU's Interplanetary Initiative. And uh, good morning, good afternoon, depending on when and where you're tuning in from. It looks like we have some folks from um, abroad. It's super exciting. Next slide, please. So for the next hour, we're going to hear from our uh, pilot project leads. But before we do, I want to um, just lay out a few uh, logistical details for you. So um, this is a, a webinar format. So we don't see you all but you have the ability to communicate with us via the chat and as well as the Q&A. Um, we'll be recording this today. We really care about your feedback. You're gonna get um, a link to provide us some feedback um, after this, uh, this, this uh, webinar, but um, uh, we've really strived to keep this to an hour to be mindful of your precious time, but we also heard from you that you'd like to interact with our presenters with some Q&A. So we're going to try to accommodate both today and you know, feel free to put your questions in the Q&A uh, function of Zoom. Um, our presenters will respond uh, real time if they can through the Q&A chat, but otherwise keep them to the end. So everyone's going to stick around to okay. the end, at the end and we can um, have a conversation and they can answer live your questions. All right. Let's see, the last thing to share with you, sorry, if we can go back. Um, if you're not familiar with the Sun Devil Re Rewards Program, this is a program whereby when you uh, participate in events like the one you're uh, tuning into today, you can earn pitchforks. And then when you have, when you've accumulated pitchforks, you can turn them in and you can claim a ASU cool swag. In fact, now we also have some nice space swag for you to select from. So uh, by joining us today, you'll you'll be able to take advantage of the Sun Devil Rewards program. So we encourage you to do that. All right, next slide, Sally, thanks. So we do these uh, webinars quarterly. Um, so the next one will be in the spring, March 15th, 11 a.m., mark your calendars. In the spring and in the fall, we focus on giving you updates on our educational programs, our, uh, our lab projects, as well as our partnerships. And, and in the summer and in the winter, the next one being June 15th at 11 a.m., we focus on our pilot projects. So this is going to be an interim sort of progress report for most of these projects. Um, and then at the end of the year, it's sort of a year-end recap of the amazing things that these teams have accomplished. So please mark your calendars for all of that. Next slide. So that concludes my welcoming all of you. So we're really excited to have you join us today. Um, I'm going to introduce uh, all of our pilot projects uh, and speakers, but before I do, I wanted to give you a little bit of context around how we come up with these projects in the first place. So next slide. So we um, seed fund a number of projects every year um, that are conceptualized and launched through a very specific process that we call our Big Questions Teaming Method that involves participating in a roughly two-hour workshop. So during this workshop, we brainstorm big questions, teams form, and we sort of start outlining or the teams start outlining what they might accomplish within a year. They pitch to us. Um, and then they kind of refine their thinking and more formally apply for funding. We fund these projects one year at a time. Uh, in some cases, we do incubate them for multiple years. And, um, and then ultimately, we want to see them move beyond interplanetary. We want them to grow in scope and impact and in scale. And that can really take a lot of different forms um, as far as um, the impact that we're looking for. So you can see here roughly sort of our process. Just from a purely financial metric, which is just one of many metrics by which we measure impact, for every dollar that we've invested in these projects, our, um, uh, the teams have uh, secured $8 in contracts and grants and things like royalties, really depending on the type of output uh, that these projects create. Next slide. So I thought it might be uh, informative to spotlight a few of our projects that have quote unquote graduated from our uh, pilot project status. 
Uh, the first, and all of these projects, by the way, you can learn more about on the Interplanetary Initiative website. So I encourage you to go and peruse there. Uh, there are about 35 projects to date that we've uh, that we've supported. So here's just a spotlight on a few. The first is Port of Mars, which is a social science game that started as a card game and evolved uh, into a video game. And Lance Garavi, who will be presenting a different, very different project today, uh, was the lead on this particular project, which led to a peer-reviewed publication and an NSF grant. So some very uh, sort of traditional academic successes there for this project, which continues on, and we're very, very excited about that. Um, SpaceWorks uh, was, is a workforce development class that's offered to undergraduate students, uh, primarily uh, in the schools of engineering and the earth and space exploration, to participate in NASA mission-focused project-based learning experiences. And this project, as you can see here, we, we supported for about four years. Uh, they, they, they were all incubated for a number of years, um, and then won a student collaboration contract for the, the NASA Lucy, uh, Lucy mission, and also a significant uh, grant uh, for an education to continue to support this program uh, for our science and engineering students. So that was a huge win. And then the last um, graduated project that we wanted to sort of highlight is uh, CIVIC, and this was uh, really a, initially a software uh, simulation tool that uh, served to research sort of the minimum uh, complexities re required to sustain life in uh, long duration off-world missions. And this is now turning into a physical uh, um, laboratory, if you will, down by uh, U of A in Biosphere 2. And um, I believe that this space will be uh, open to uh, a visit sometime this year. So very excited about that. And we can give you some updates. It was also uh, featured on National Geographic Resource Library and, um, and the lead developed a partnership with National Geographic. So these are some of the successes that we'd love to see for our pilot projects. Uh, there are a lot more. And in fact, we're going to probably look to sort of share some of these success stories, like where, you know, where are they now um, in terms of all the impacts that these uh, teams have made. All right. Um, next slide, please. So how can you all get involved? There are really a lot of ways. So for students, um, first of all, you're going to see as each of these presenters share the their their teams. They're very large teams. These projects go that go on for multiple years uh, involve uh, very uh, diverse teams of students, faculty, external collaborators, and you'll see that. Um, so for this year, we are really excited to partner with Luminosity Lab, um, which is uh, um, a, a program based here at ASU that brings together interdisciplinary groups of students to work on various exciting pro projects. And so we're going to be working on with them this year um, to ideate on some pilot projects. So more details on that to come uh, in the spring of 2023 for projects that would start next year. And then you, if any of the um, projects that you learn about today pique your interest and you think you can contribute in a meaningful way, we would love to hear from you. Feel free to reach out to the project leads um, or to anyone on the II team. Uh, faculty are critical to the process of launching and conceptualizing these projects. Um, and, and again, you'll see there are many uh, uh, opportunities for faculty to collaborate. Um, so reach out if um, any of these projects or if you have ideas that you want to contribute to, um, to our work. And then last sort of shout out or call here is to program leaders. Um, if you are intrigued by this methodology and you think it might um, serve your programs or units as far as spurring uh, interdisciplinary, new interdisciplinary research projects, we're very keen on sort of uh, um, um, exploring how we can adapt what we've been doing for interplanetary in other contexts. So we'd love to hear from you if this is also an area that um, is of interest. Next slide. Okay, so I'm gonna move into uh, the topic at hand here, which is to talk about and to introduce to you the progress made on nine different pilot projects that we've been supporting so far this year. As you can see from this list, there are a number of projects that are that just started, you know, kicking off over the summer and others that are being uh, renewed. Uh, I wanna mention that so the many of these newer projects uh, stem from a thought leadership retreat that we host every year with leading um, uh, thinkers from academia, from industry, from government that come and do the big questions teaming process with us over a weekend and come up with 
uh, you know, the big, the big questions relevant to the industry and also some ideas for projects. So a number of these that are going to be presented today have come from that, um, that retreat. And then others um, have been um, sort of, you know, uh, outcrops from existing projects. And we're really excited when we see that. So our Space Exploration and Sustainable Development Project is a great example of that. Eric Stribling will be presenting that project, as well as Space Hack and Global Space Tech, which sort of evolved from the work that was done last year on that original project. And that applies to Mars on the field as well. So we have uh, been supporting Five Senses in Space, a, a project led by uh, Dr. Robert Likamwa for many years. And that project evolved and um, and produced a lot of great uh, innovations. And so Mars on the Field is sort of the next evolution of this project. He has passed the baton to two uh, very uh, talented faculty, and we're super excited to have both of them co-lead Mars on the Field. And so I'm going to introduce them next, and then um, excited to hear from them as far as what they've been, how they've been moving this grand vision forward. Next slide. So um, I will introduce, um, I think we have the two leads that are going to be presenting today. So we have Laura Chahanovitz, who's an associate professor of arts, media and engineering and graphic information technology here at ASU and the Media and Immersive Experience Center, our new mix center down in Mesa. Uh, Laura is a designer and artist who uses world building to, co to collaboratively build spatial spatialized content focused on science and art, embodiment, identity, health, and technology. Laura's world building projects have resulted in films, animations, interactive operas, virtual reality experiences shown at Sundance Film Festival, multimedia collections displayed at the Venice Biennale, and concepts for augmented reality apps and digital multimedia books. That all sounds so cool. And then uh, D.B. Bauer, um, who's an assistant professor of games and interactive media in the School of Arts, Media and Engineering. D.B.'s research focuses on creating new ways to present and share ideas using immersive technologies like virtual reality and 3D media. In addition to a research background in media studies, design and the digital humanities, D.B.'s worked, worked for many years in the media industry, spanning uh, public TV, radio, and independent films, as well as in digital preservation of university archives. It's really a powerhouse team, and thank you both so much for taking the lead on this project, and over to you. Thank you so much. Um, good morning, everybody. Uh, thank you again for joining us today. I'm D.B., a uh, co-PI on this project. The other project co-PI, uh, Laura Shahanowitz, had hoped to be, but is unfortunately not well enough to present with me today, but we'll hear from Laura briefly at the end of our project overview. So first, we'd like to thank the Interplanetary Initiative for setting up this uh, event today and for everything that you all do. This project is made possible with their generous support and guidance. So again, thank you so much. Um, we're excited to share our project with you, so let's get started. Next slide, please. All right, so our big question is, how can we share research about Mars in an interactive, immersive, engaging, and accessible way to galvanize interests in both space exploration and scientific research? Next slide, please. Mars in the Field is a virtual reality experience that takes place on the Sun Devil Stadium football field. The project invites you to first learn about past, present, and future understandings of Mars via art, culture, and science. You will travel across a timeline of historical research and ideas about Mars inside an immersive starscape. As you walk through the stars, you'll have the chance to learn about how human understandings of Mars have developed over time. Second, you will experience the scientific method in action. This journey reveals how people have created hypotheses about Mars over time, many of which have been disproven, re rewritten, or expanded in the unexpected directions as our explorations of space have helped us gain new knowledge about the realities of Mars. Third, the experience culminates in the opportunity to walk the third, uh, excuse me, to walk the 3D Martian surface created from some of the most recent photos sent back to Earth by the many machines currently researching Mars today. Next slide, please. Our accomplishments to date include first, 
conducting in-depth research into cultural, artistic, and scientific knowledge over time with a focus on NASA's Mars mission starting in the 1960s to the present. Studying research about Mars presents a huge challenge because humans have been captivated by the red planet for millennia. To address this, we've drawn from a wide range of understandings over the centuries, from visual observations to early astronomy and the invention of the telescope, which are all part of the long history of Mars research that continues today. This story also reveals how technology and media have developed over time. It demonstrates how we learn about the universe, not only through our own senses, but also through technologies that extend beyond human perception. Our second major accomplishment is the creative design and technical prototyping of the VR experience itself, how it looks, how it sounds, and so on. What's exciting to our team is the chance to create and share a networked VR experience that takes place across an entire football field. Third, using 3D photogrammetry, we use images recently taken by the Perseverance rover with its onboard camera, MassCam Z, and digitally stitch them together to create a 3D immersive environment. This allows users to actually feel as though they're standing on Mars. The images shown here are examples of photos taken by Perseverance mixed with creative elements that come together in the VR experience. Finally, we've had the incredible opportunity to interview Mars scientists ranging from planetary geologists to people who have worked with the Hubble Space Telescope to scientists who are part of major NASA missions, including those of Curiosity, Spirit, Opportunity, Perseverance, and Ingenuity. These scientists often speak to the collaborative nature of planetary research, the passion that motivates their work, and the excitement of working on Mars research over the years. We find the human stories of Mars to be some of the most compelling aspects of this experience. Final slide, please. Please feel free to reach out if you would like to collaborate with us. Send us your favorite media stories about Mars, or make sure we consider interviewing your favorite Martian scientists. We look forward to sharing this project with you in the future when you can join us on Mars on the field. Thank you. Thank you. Amazing. Thank you both so much. Um, great progress to date and can't wait for um, us all to be able to experience this. So for folks that are joining us, um, feel free to, if you do have questions, put them in the Q&A. Uh, we will answer them um, through the app if uh, that makes sense, or we'll hold them to the end if uh, there's more to say. So feel free to do that. So we are gonna shift gears uh, just a tad and uh, moving to um, our project entitled Preventing Space War, which um, is an ambitious project. And I'd like to in, uh, introduce uh, Daniel Rothenberg, who is our faculty member leading this project. So a little bit about Daniel. He's a professor of practice in the School of Politics and Global Studies at ASU, co-director of the Center on the Future of War. And he's also a senior fellow at New America, a DC-based think tank. He works on human rights, armed conflict, and transitional uh, justice, and has designed and managed rule of law projects in Afghanistan, Iraq, East Africa, and throughout Latin America. He has written a number of books, which include uh, With These Hands, Memory of Silence, the Guatemalan Truth Commission Report, Drone Wars, Transforming Conflict Law and Policy, and finally, Understanding the New Proxy Wars. We're really thrilled to have this partnership with uh, the Center on the Future of War and to be working with Daniel on um, advancing some meet very important conversations on this particular topic. Thanks, Daniel, for being here, and over to you. Hi, everybody. Uh, thank you, uh, Jessica, for such a nice introduction. Thanks to everyone who's joining us and to the Interplanetary Initiative. Um, so I'm going to just give you a little overview of this project. It is designed to answer a question, how do we reduce the probability of cataclysmic space war by redefining the way that space is understood and by laying the foundations for an innovative interdisciplinary commitment to preserving space, preserving space as a collaborative domain free from war. So next slide. Um, so the key to this project is to convene experts and stakeholders who address three topics, which will be engaged in a variety of different ways, including white papers, uh, our, our forum in the spring, and ideally a series of projects that will take off um, as this initiative you know, advances. So first is understanding the consequences and pathways to conflict in space. Second is open source intelligence for space domain awareness. And the third is understanding how space, space ownership and space conflict is conceptualized socially, 
politically and culturally. Uh, but leaving aside just this, all these words, uh, it's worth reflecting on just how strange space is in a way. Space has always been a part of the human condition here on Earth, of course, but for most of uh, human society, space has not been a, a domain that human beings have been able to engage in directly. And of course, you know, from the mid 20th century on, we've sent people into space and increasingly we've done more and more things in space. We're now at a stage in our engagement with space that's actually entirely new. The costs of getting into space are far lower. As you know, ordinary companies can go into space and virtually all of our communications or many of our communications and much of what we take for granted here on earth goes through space in a variety of ways. So it's a domain of engagement for which we don't yet have a good language to deal with. For years, there was a ban on dealing with space war and space was understood to be a, a, a place, a domain outside of conflict, but that's clearly not the case now in, in reality and, and we don't know what's coming forward. So next slide. Accomplished to date. So we've established a, a really excellent project team. It's a little complex because they're all over the world, particularly the US, uh, United Kingdom and Australia. And this includes faculty, students, industry representatives, military, members of the military, current and former, and civil society representatives. Uh, we've set a forum, which you're all invited to, uh, in, in, uh, certainly online and, and uh, maybe in person as well. Uh, and May, from May 10th to 11th it, uh, in New America, which is our center's partner institution in Washington, DC. We all have, we've already um, started to schedule our keynotes and participants and we'll have a schedule sometime you know, in, in, in the new year. We have been advancing in research areas and moving forward on a variety of white paper topics and figuring out who will contribute to which issues. You know, one of the most interesting papers that we know is, is in the pipeline is from um, uh, um, a member of the US military working uh, at, al alongside with NATO partners talking about the legal issues of, of space war, which is complex because much of the law of war is, has been structured around what we com commonly understood to be war. Uh, what, what's in your mind as war and what takes place on earth. Uh, ASU student researchers are working on this project and they're advancing on our website and putting together resources for public access. And we actually uh, put it together, we were part of one uh, proposal for external research funding to the Australian government. We'll find out in the spring if that's come through. Um, and all of these various um, activities are, are advancing. So next slide. So we have, here's a list of our team members. I mean, it's, the, the font is very small, but you can probably get a sense if you look at them that we have ASU partners. We have a retired, one of our faculty members retired three-star uh, General from Marine Corps. We have a number of people from, we have uh, Justin Chandler from Space Force. We have folks from Flinders University, Oxford University, um, University of New South Wales, um, and uh, King's College, London. Uh, we also, I don't know if you're all familiar, but we also have a special partnership called the Plus Alliance linking ASU, UNSW and King's College London. And what's nice about this project is it helps, it's, it's, we've been able to kind of piggyback and engage that, that existing partnership, which is, which is a pretty high profile partnership involving the presidents and leadership of all three universities. Um, and next slide. Oh, so here we are. Okay, so just if you have any questions, it's pretty easy to reach out to me personally at my email. It's easy to reach out through the Interplanetary Institute. Um, and if, frankly, if anybody here would like to be included in emails about the project or have ideas about where we might go or conceivably could even join the team depending on, on you know, your interest and your background. Um, but thanks so much for joining us today. And we're very excited about seeing where this project goes. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Daniel. Um, we love, we definitely love to see our projects sort of connect and tap into other things that are happening and synergizing efforts. So that's a great example of um, a project doing that. And we'd love to see that. Um, there are some questions, Daniel, FYI, that are coming through sure. the chat. Okay. So we can say if it's okay with you, just to make sure we can get through all of the pre presentations. We'll save them to the end. Um, so maybe, Daniel, if you want to take a look at the questions and think, think about how you want to answer them at the end, that'd be fantastic. Okay. All good. right. Great. So um, 
Perfect. Let's move on to our next presenter, Chris Bryan, who's going to be talking about a project called Global Heat Map of Space Activities. And Chris is an assistant professor in the School of Computing and Augmented Intelligence here at ASU. It's located in the Ira A. Fulton Schools of Engineering, and he leads the Sonoran Visualization Laboratory, which researches data visualization, human computer interaction, augmented and virtual reality, and data science. In particular, his group develops novel designs, algorithms, statistical models, and techniques to support analysis and decision making, particularly for complex data, which all applies very well to this project. So thanks, Chris, for being here and over to you. Hey, thanks, Jessica. Um, you, you can go to the next slide. <clears throat> so this project is really motivated by uh, the question of what is the state of space activities globally? So, um, you know, by nations or individuals or, or funded research or companies, um, what actually is going on in, in terms of space related activities? Um, so you can kind of think about that, like by countries or agencies or projects, project size, how much money is being sent, what types of topics are being addressed, what are the research questions are being investigated. Um, and so the idea with this project uh, succinctly is we want to develop uh, a geographic, what we call a heat map. Um, based on publicly accessible data, news, articles, web pages that can visualize space activities through the lens of things like their key benefits, their drivers, what are their end goals, um, kind of tracked by different projects over time, uh, investment levels, and, and where they're actually occurring are, around the world. Um, so next slide. Yeah, so so again, our, our goal is to develop this this online heat map that, that visualizes space activities. Um, and, and we're doing this by collecting or scraping uh, public data, news articles, websites. Um, and, and really what, what the idea with this heat map is to represent an effective way to communicate about what's actually happening. What are the activities that are space related that are, that are going on around the world? Um, it, it's also gonna present kind of a, a dynamic and interactive way to to look at this activity. So you could think as a, as a stakeholder, you might use this to, to understand like, what are the benefits of, um, you know, of, of a decision that we make in terms of like the space activities we wanna pursue. Uh, so, so stakeholders can engage with this information and leverage it as a way to shape future projects or, or goals. Um, so we do have an external team members, uh, an, an external team of several stakeholders who are uh, helping kind of Kind of guide like understand like what can be the 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 goals or the the, the ways that this type of um this type of project can benefit benefit their work uh, and next slide please so so really this is right, right now there's this is a big software engineering project um so one of the fun things i think about this project is we brought on two undergraduate students and they're doing a, a lot of software engineering they've worked really hard this this fall semester to really do a bunch of grunt work, a bunch of coding. Um, they've uh, so we had a, an, an initial list of over 100 websites, about 100 websites that that were available to scrape data from. So we've identified kind of an, an initial set of target websites, and they've written several scripts to, to scrape these sites to process data, uh, news articles, um, pages, things like that. Um, and so we're currently defining, uh, refining, debugging those. Uh, one of the fun things about this is um, they're getting to learn a lot of new technologies, and we're getting to play with some fun things, uh, with scraper technologies, uh, database technologies, um, even some language models that we're we're having some fun with. Uh, actually, taking these articles and parsing them, extracting the topics or the themes or the locations that are being that are being used. So for them, it's been a really good experience, and they're they're doing a really good job. Um, so one of kind of at the current state of the project, uh, we're, we've basically built the back end this semester. We've uh, scraped an initial set of data. We're going to continue scraping through, this, through the spring, processing it, uh, storing it on, a, on an online database on an AWS instance. Um, and then after this, uh, as we start the next semester, we're going to transition more into the front end, actually building a, a web-based dashboard to visualize, uh, to query for space activities and to visualize them using kind of a, a heat map type of visualization. So um, that will be the main focus as we uh, as we go into the spring. Uh, the other thing I wanna note is we've had one meeting with our external stakeholders 
this fall. Uh, we'll be doing those more regularly in the spring as we actually generate the more uh, visual, the more interactive parts of this um, projects. Uh, and so one of the main goals of, of these meetings is to identify future uh, funding opportunities or collaborative uh, agreements that, that we can identify and target with this work. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so um, so this is our team right here. Uh, so the first three, so I'm, so I'm listed first, but Mohammed and Rohan are the two undergraduates. Uh, Mohammed, he's only a sophomore and Rohan is a junior. So I, I just really wanna highlight, like this team is really being driven by um, some undergrads and they're doing a really good job. Uh, everyone else are, are some of the external folks that, that are participating in this, uh, like Amir and, and Chris. Uh, we have folks from XPRIZE, the Planetary Society, several artists, media artists, painters, digital artists. Um, so yeah, uh, I, I'm not really sticking this landing. But... <laughs> You're doing great, Chris. Awesome. That is perfect. Thank you so okay. much. We're, we're super excited uh, about this project and uh, definitely look forward to see, having something to look at. And I agree with you, a lot of these external um, advisors will um, really start sort of weighing in once there is something to look at a prototype. Um, this was a project that came out of last year's Space Futures Convening, the uh, thought leadership retreat that I uh, mentioned uh, earlier, uh, driven and, um, you know, uh, really by Anusha Ansari that you see here on the list at XPRIZE, um, because nothing like this exists, where you have a holistic view, real time of all that's driving the space, space activity across the globe to inform where investment is happening, should be happening in the future. And so we feel that this is going to be a very transformative and a high impact tool to the industry, to the sector. So thanks so much, Chris. Awesome. Um, all right, next, I'd like to introduce Matt Sosen. Um, this is a project that we have been supporting for a number of years. Matt is going to give us an update. Um, he is a creative director at Meteor Studios under uh, the leadership of Dr. Robert Likamwa, who I mentioned earlier and has been partnering with Interplanetary for a number of years. Um, he's a, a master's in fine arts candidate at the School of Theater and Arts, Media and Engineering. Uh, he's very excited to continue uh, managing this project, uh, the Earth Operations Center. And so over to you, Matt, thank you for being here. Thanks for having me. Um, yeah, as Jessica mentioned, this is not the first year with Earth Operations Center. So some of you might know this project already, but for those of you who don't, I'm gonna give a little overview of why this project exists, where it came from and where it stands today. So first I'm gonna start with um, some questions that influenced um, the initial impetus for the project itself. Uh, while we know that the process of climate change will unfold over decades and centuries, we have not done as much as we can to establish institutions that can operate and evolve over those time periods as well. And while we have hundreds of organizations around the world conducting vital research into understanding and modeling the relevant processes, we haven't yet established an organization that is dedicated to the continual and integrated development of the two core modeling fields, that being earth systems modeling and economic modeling, and to embed the results in a physical visual visualization environment that can inform and shape decision-making. Thus, the Earth Operations Center as we are building it out today. Uh, doing this project is going to be critical to the effective management of the emerging climate crisis here on Earth, and also to the future of humankind's ability to understand and manage complex planetary systems elsewhere in general. So the goal of this project is to create um, such a space in both physical and virtual formats, and the resulting spaces will have two primary and important impacts. The first is to enable new insights into the nature and progress of climate change through multidisciplinary syncretic collaboration across a diverse array of fields and cultures. And two, the ability to communicate those insights to critical stakeholders of a wide variety of backgrounds from policymakers, educators, uh, corporate partners, the media, um, communities through immersive affective experiences. So thus far, we're working towards specifically building out a VR experience of an Earth Operations Center. This is a simulation to be used for STEM learning about climate change as a community and science meeting space and to enable new ways of visualizing climate data. Second, we're building, a, we want to build a, an architectural design and visualization of a physical Earth Operations Center. And third, we want to develop partnerships to create STEM oriented programming around both of these uh, materializations. Next slide, please. So um, 
thus far, we have built an initial fully operational, now multiplayer VR experience of EOC. I think if you click again, you might play this video. Might as well. Yep. And this is an example of just a rough demo of our, our VR experience that we have, the first iteration, which we're currently, um, this is a bit old, but we're developing an even more beautiful experience now. Um, we have some initial partnerships with Dreamscape Learn and uh, Planet Lab. Um, we're de developing initial grant applications and proposals with these partnerships to actually develop uh, a physical system, even more than architectural visualizations and STEM programming. And uh, we're trying to build out a first draft of an architectural visualization that can be uh, demoed at conferences and part of our STEM learning initiative. Next slide. Um, if you'd like to get involved, please reach out to myself. Um, I'm my email is on the initial slide here, or Jake Pinholster, who's the project lead. This project has been worked on um, by a variety of people, including um, folks at MIT and NASA, Alex McDonald, their, their chief financial uh, economist, and um, a bunch of really wonderful ASU undergrads, graduate, and PhD students. We're working on everything from the virtual reality development on in a game engine to new ways of data visualization um, with economic modeling um, to architectural visualization and design methodology. Um, so it's been a really incredible project to work on personally, and I'm really excited to see where it goes. Wonderful, thank you so much, Matt. So are we, um, and we'd love to see the, the latest iteration of that VR experience um, and, uh, and check it out. So thank you again, and um, let's move to the next project. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce Anne Capusta, who's been a great partner on this new project called Jedi Space, which emerged as well from our Space Futures convening last year. Uh, a little bit about Anne. She is the co-founder and managing director of Think Space Consulting, supporting cutting edge missions in space and organizations with a mission to do good here on Earth. And is focused on DEI efforts in the industry, accessibility and disability inclusion in space exploration, and uses space as a vital resource to fight climate change, starting with the wildfire crisis. Prior to full-time entrepreneurship, Anne led internal R&D and external innovation strategy for a digital and emerging technology think tank, and spent over a decade in the aerospace industry on projects ranging from satellite technologies, space weather research, and human space flights. So thank you, Anne, for telling us about Jedi Space. Over to you. Awesome. Thanks so much, everyone. And hello, good morning, good afternoon. Uh, so next slide, please. So Jedi Space is uh, really an initiative to try to help understand how we build a just, equitable, diverse, and inclusive space for all of humanity. It's a really important question to be asking at the current time, given the changes in the space industry and you know, kind of this refresh of, um, you know, with an influx of commercial companies kind of coming in, we have the opportunity to kind of relook at space in a different light. And we want to make sure that as we're doing that, we're building it with, um, you know, diverse and inclusive practices at the foundation at the groundwork, and really making sure that we look at this from a global perspective as well, um, so that we're not just uh, US focused, but how do we bring in um, global diversity uh, into the emerging space force and bring equity um, kind of around the globe as space as a resource for all. Next slide, please. So how do we do this? It's a pretty big goal uh, in a short time window to do it in. So uh, we seek to answer, answer this question by developing a community of practice. Uh, we don't want to build this in a silo. It's really, really important that we work together to define what these key principles and policies are for a Jedi space. Uh, and then make sure that we articulate these out to the change makers and the decision makers in the space industry um, to really create this change in this time window that we have. Um, so we have kind of a, a four step plan that we're in the middle of um, for this year long uh, initiative. Uh, and the first is to establish this global community um, and make sure that, you know, we've got kind of a common understanding that everybody has an equitable representation in the community to help us define this. Uh, from that community, we want to engage them in conversations um, around what this definition of JEDI is and then how we can establish that into these best policies and practices 
um, to use throughout the industry. Uh, we're going to do this through uh, both a series of surveys uh, that have already started and then a series of speaker uh, sessions and focus groups where we can have uh, you know, broader and more open dialogue and conversation with our community, which will start uh, beginning of next year. From all of this, we're going to create an action-oriented toolkit. Um, so we're going to use this data-driven and community-driven approach to turn these uh, insights into action. Um, and we're going to then feed this to uh, industry leaders uh, and the space community who really have been, you know, kind of putting DEI uh, and inclusion practices at the top of their priority list, but they don't really have a, a way to do that, a how. Um, so we really want to be that source to provide that how to these companies that, um, you know, are really starting to focus on, uh, you know, making sure that they're developing inclusive uh, and equitable practices in the space industry. Uh, so we're going to develop that kind of at the end of the project based on the data that we collect. And then we're going to start to initiate those discussions with the space sector um, and create a shared commitment of accountability and responsibility uh, for, uh, for creating a JEDI space. Next slide, please. So what have we done so far on this? Uh, the team has been incredibly busy uh, this year, and uh, we continue, we intend to continue that momentum into next year. Uh, we've created our first uh, pilot survey. Um, it's a digital survey with uh, 10 questions, um, really focused on getting to the core of how people feel the industry is now um, and what barriers and obstacles they feel that they face based on their given backgrounds um, and cultures. Uh, we have received IRB approval, so this is, you know, an official research study, um, and we've received 75 responses to date on our survey. Uh, at the same time, we're developing this community of practice, as I talked about. Uh, so we have 96 active community members right now, uh, and uh, we've started a series of monthly newsletters um, where we'll update folks on the findings that we have, introduce new discussion topics, um, as well as uh, introducing our four-part speaker series, which I uh, discussed in the last slide. And then we started our engagement already. So obviously this is a little bit how we've connected with the community. Um, we started out this initial push at uh, by attending uh, the International Astronautical Congress in uh, Paris. Uh, and we did this intentionally to get an international participation from the get-go. Um, so we really wanted to make sure that we weren't too US focused. We really wanted to make sure that we were engaging the global community. And we thought the best way to do that was by doing our initial community outreach at a global international space conference. Um, so we went to Paris, uh, we uh, walked around with iPads, collected survey responses, um, and started to really kind of do that initial uh, community engagement push there. And it was really, really wonderful. Uh, next slide. So final slide is our amazing team. Um, we're a small but nimble team uh, with a lot of people from industry uh, who are really passionate about uh, this work and passionate about making sure that what we do makes an impact. Um, so I'm really excited about the team that we have, uh, you know, on hand, as well as a couple of students at ASU who are also really passionate. Um, what's unique to our team is that we're not all inside the space sector. Um, a bunch of us are, but some of us aren't. And we're trying to bring that perspective that, um, you know, diversity also includes diversity of thought and diversity of discipline. Um, so we're really trying to like build this foundation and this groundwork um, with our team and then with our community. Um, so uh, if you are interested in joining our community uh, or interested in taking our survey, I think Taryn dropped the link uh, in the in the chat there. Um, and uh, my contact information is here and happy to connect and reach out with anybody who's interested. So thank you very much for the time. Excellent. Thanks, Anne. Looks like people are very excited about this project in particular. Uh, based on the comments there, I do want to say that when you do sign up and participate in, I think, the survey or sign up to be part of the community, I don't know if you guys see this here, but you do get, you'll get a nice little pin, a Jedi space pin here. That's pretty cool. So um, I also want to just point out that um, where sort of our efforts uh, synergize, another example of that is um, ASU is one of the partners on the Orbital Reef project. And part of what we're thinking about uh, and um, in, in that context uh, is also um, looking at the novel DIA sort of policies and practices within the context of the space industry broadly, but also some of these future space stations. And so both Anne Kapusta as well as Diana Aiden-Schenkar, who I know is out there um 
tuning in uh, and, and the, the PI here on the ASU side on the project are both involved on both sides. So we're really looking to coordinate and synergize all of our efforts. And that's another great example of that. Thank you, Anne. All right. So um, now over to uh, Lance Garavi, who uh, may need no introduction. He has been involved in so many great projects for us. And he's also, of course, the associate director here at uh, at Interplanetary, but I will give you a formal introduction, Lance. So um, Lance is a professor in the School of Music, Dance, and Theater, an associate director, as I said, of ASU's Interplanetary Initiative. His work focuses on points of intersection between performance, technology, science, and religion. He specializes in leading transdisciplinary teams of artists, scientists, designers, and engineers to create compelling experiences and advance research. And um, this is a project called Sacred Space. Last year, we funded a slightly different project that was called Religious Space, I believe. Um, and so uh, we're really excited generally to be investing in, continuing to invest in, in sort of dialogue in this intersection of religion, spirituality, and space. So thank you, Lance, for taking on sort of this project and moving the ball forward and over to you. Thank you, Jessica, for that introduction. Yeah, the project is called Sacred Space religion and cosmic exploration. Next slide, please. And so uh, the, our, our big question is, how do we stimulate thought and discussion on the intersections of religion and space exploration? Next slide. So um, the, the great evolutionary biologist, Stephen Jay Gould, uh, once famously described uh, science and religion as, quote, non-overlapping magisteria. Awesome uh, term there. Uh, so for, for him, science and religion are two entirely separate domains with two entirely different and mutually exclusive, non-overlapping subjects of inquiry. Now, of course, most everyone would describe space exploration as a scientific endeavor. So what the heck could space exploration and religion possibly have to do with one another? Well, actually quite a lot, uh, Gould's maxim notwithstanding. Space exploration isn't isolated from culture somehow. Culture is where we imagine and practice the project of space exploration. And religion is an inseparable, inseparable part of those cultures. So as our project uh, will show, the histories, the ideologies, narratives, and practices of religion are actually central to the project of conceiving and building human space futures. And as we, as we move out into space, religion and religious ideas are gonna accompany us regardless of whether we're, we're conscious of them or not. So we're, um, uh, I and, and, and the, uh, my, my co-lead are going to produce a series of public symposia that will put uh, diverse guests from the space sector and from various religious traditions in dialogue around these questions. And so we've got four questions here, um, and we'll have four separate symposia, uh, one for, for each of those questions. Um, we will uh, have a registration page up soon, so be sure to sign up to attend these symposiums. They'll be symposia. They'll be in March uh, and early April of 2023, and they'll be online. Um, so no matter where you are, you can attend. So be sure to sign up and um, and share the word with other folks in your network. You can um, uh, reach out to me if you want more information, or contact me through the Interplanetary Initiative website. Next slide, please. Uh, uh, so, so far we've uh, assembled the team, identified a structure for those strategies, identified the big questions and guests, who sent out invitations and secured agreement from almost all of the guests uh, that we've targeted. Next slide. And so the team is small but mighty, uh, and I want to uh, give a special shout out to Mary Jane Rubenstein, uh, my colleague, whose book, Astrotopia, just came out two weeks ago in time for Christmas. Buy copies. Um, so uh, it, the thing is, uh, religion and space exploration 
have always been in conversation. We're just making that conversation public. So thank you. Nice ending. Thank you, Lance. Um, we're very excited about uh, these convers future conversations. I will make a quick plug for um, a fellowship that we are offering that we are actually going to push out to the fall of next year, but it's going to be a fellowship that is uh, really very much focused on these same types of questions. If this is something you're interested in, reach out to me um, and I can give you more information about that. Thank you, Lance. All right, so we um, we have 10 more minutes and we have three more projects, but thankfully they all are somewhat synergistic and all will be are led by Eric Stribling. So um, I think Eric will be able to be efficient with uh, with this last uh, these last presentations and a little bit about Eric, who's been a, a wonderful a team member here at Interplanetary Initiative. He's an assistant teaching professor for us. And prior to joining ASU, he taught mechanical engineering at Université des Montagnes. I'm going to say it with my French accent, which is a medical university in Cameroon. And his research uh, focuses on how engineering and technology intersect with society with an emphasis on space technologies in developing countries. Um, we're really thrilled at how this initial project that we funded last year has evolved and to lots of very exciting new directions. And so um, please, Eric, uh, over to you and thank you. Thank, thanks, Jessica, so much. Um, can we go to the next slide? Um, so uh, space exploration and sustainable development answers primarily the big question, how does uh, space exploration impact progress towards achieving the UN SDGs? And that sort of grows out of this idea um, that, you know, so often with the Interplanetary Initiative, we're thinking outside of the world, outside of, you know, extraterrestrially. And we want to turn that lens back to our own terrestrial world and ask, what does the space industry, what do space technologies, what is their impact on our environment, our society, and our governance? Uh, next slide. So uh, it's really neat moment in the development of new space and that that is that we have the ability to really at a early stage in the industry's development um, really look at their impact on our globe um, so the overall goal of this project is to develop a csr tool that is grounded uh in, in our in research that sort of can inform the development of these new industries. Uh, and so phase one last year, we focused on conducting a very large liter literature review that explored the intersection of these technologies and our global goals. This year, we're working on um, developing a better understanding of current industry CSR practices. So we're doing a lot of qualitative analysis. Uh, and then we're hoping to eventually launch a um, set of a comprehensive CSR framework. Uh, next slide. So last year, uh, our research was, we presented at the IEEE uh, ISTAS conference, and we are working on uh, getting that published in a peer uh, reviewed journal. We also partnered with Leonardo to explore also how artists understood um, the intersection between our um, between space and our in sustainability, and that was featured at several prominent art conferences. And we're currently working on a qualitative analysis of CSR ESD documents from major new space companies. So, as Jessica said, this project did sort of outgrow other projects. So can we go next slide? And this is our amazing team. Next slide. <laughs> so one of our big outgrowths was we were sort of um, one of one of the major takeaways from the work last year is that satellite data, remote sensing and earth ops, these are crucial for informed decision making that drives international efforts towards addressing uh, our global goals. Next slide. So this led to the big question, how can we involve students in leveraging these space technologies towards ach achieving the UN SDGs? Next slide. 
So uh, surprisingly, uh, satellite data is actually crucial. Half of all of the metrics used by the UN to determine whether we're making progress on, adjust, on addressing sustainability, all of these are linked to various types of satellite data. Uh, and as you can see from the slide, this is everything from mapping the spread of infectious diseases to monitoring climate change to protecting endangered species. Next slide. So uh, we've actually built up a very nice set of partners. We're working with Planet Labs, uh, the School for the Uni uh, Future of Innovation in Society, uh, hosting it in Hayden Library, and we're partnering also with ThinkSpace. All of this to... Uh, run a hackathon, which will be March 24th and 25th uh, in Hayden Library. Uh, we will be publishing uh, signups in early spring, but uh, it's a really exciting opportunity for students to uh, get trained and then actually do um, projects that hopefully have an impact beyond uh, this hackathon. So next slide. So right now students will, uh, over the course of 20, 30, about 30 hours, they will have the opportunity to uh, dig into Planet Labs data and analyze that using Google Earth Engine to address three possible uh, tracks, which include groundwater monitoring in Nepal, uh, the effect of climate change on marginalized groups in Brazil, and global climate and emissions accountability. Uh, next slide. And one exciting outgrowth out of this project already is that we are um, partnering with a, we, we have been integrated into a course. So any students who are interested, um, you can sign up for uh, FIS 494, or if you're a grad student, uh, 598, which will be a course taught this upcoming spring by Glenn Goodman and Mary Jane Parmentier, where uh, this is linked with that second um, track in our hackathon, which is uh, looking at the impacts of climate change on marginalized communities. So would love to see anybody interested reach out and you can sign up for this course. Uh, next slide. So this is our small but mighty team, as Lance said. And um, we, you know, if if there are undergrads uh, or graduate students interested in volunteering, there are some opportunities in this pilot project. Uh, next slide. And finally, um, one of the important takeaways um, is that one of the real big advantages for a, you know, of space. Uh, agencies is that these technologies that we use to go to space end up spinning out into the private sector and uh, benefiting society in various ways. You can sort of think of um, LASIK eye surgery as an example of this, where technologies developed for NASA missions ended up allowing us to, well, not me, but other people to see better. <laughs> All right, next slide. So this also has a lot of synergy with uh, last year's fellow fellowship. So uh, Theodora Ogden is uh, helping advise this team, but we're looking into how can key spinoff technologies from the space sector help advance new space agencies and economies. Next slide. The, the logic here is that technology transfer is a um, large driver of why governments decide to fund space agencies. So we're looking at five countries, Brazil, Saudi Arabia, South Korea, South Africa, and Ecuador. And in, these are various emergent space nations where we can, at, at various stages, and we're looking at how technologies from these space stage, uh, these uh, space agencies are ending up in uh, either the educational or in the private uh, business sector. Uh, and so I believe that leaves us with two minutes.
Uh, so I'll one pass minute, one minute. <laughs> one minute. All right. So I'll, thank one you so much. And I'll pass it back to Jessica. Oh, thank you so much, Eric. I appreciate it. Um, yeah. So uh, we're very excited about the progress on all three of these projects. And thank you, Eric, for spearheading all three. It's a lot of work and, um, and uh, we're really pleased with the uh, progress. So just to quickly wrap up, um, our next webinar, as I mentioned earlier, will be in the spring. We're going to be focusing on our educational programs, our partnerships, and our lab projects. Next slide. Um, so um, we'll also send you a link to this, but we really want to hear from you. We'd like to incorporate your feedback, your thoughts to make this uh, even more always more impactful and useful to those that tune in. And thank you all for tuning in. We really appreciate it. Next slide. Um, and um, I think there is one other slide just to sort of stay in touch here. There we go. So Please do follow us. We have a monthly newsletter as well um, where you uh, can stay in touch with all that we're doing here interplanetary. We do encourage you to, um, to sign up for that. And then just, um, we do, it is 11 o'clock. So uh, there was one question that came through in the chat. Maybe we can address that one for anyone else that needs to drop off. Thank you so much. And thanks for tuning in. And we'll see you in the spring. Um, Daniel, do you want to maybe take the one question? Hopefully he's sticking around. I think this was a question. I'll have to go back quite a bit to find it. Uh, but I will read the question because I did jot it down here. Um, since we saw Russia quickly go to threatening to not return an American astronaut at the beginning of the war with Ukraine, how do you anticipate taking, anticipate taking global politics out of the risk of space war? That's a great question. Um, and, and thank you. We we can't take global politics out of um, the management of space. Um, the question is, how can we use global politics, whatever that is? How can we use the tools of, of interactions in a way to reduce the possibility of space war? Uh, it, what does that mean? It's, it's not so easy to engage. I mean, when we think of space war, we sometimes think of, you know, like Star Wars type battles in space. But really, a lot of what happens in space is space is one of the primary ways through which contemporary war is managed. Uh, communications, whether satellites and various types of communications, the military alone has a whole satellite system, not just the US military, other militaries. In fact, satellites are essential to the war in Ukraine. The US shares a lot of fairly extraordinary satellite based information with Ukrainian forces and all sorts of other information gathering materials that come through space communication mechanisms as you may know in, in ukraine conflict right now you know the 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 private mode of ensuring online access internet both on the battlefield and in civilian spaces is managed through not through military mechanisms but through private space links so anyhow it's a complicated question we don't currently have an operational model with clear norms, clear rules, or an oversight mechanism um, for the type of conflict issues that arise in the contemporary space domain. Previously, we had we have space law, but it really uh, was developed quite a long time ago with a very general sense that space should not be a domain of war. And at that time, only a handful of states in the world could even get into space in any serious way. Now we're in a new world where private actors can get into space, where all kinds of attacks, just think of cyber attacks and how severe they could be, can come through space. So, you know, this is a tall order, um, but we do need to address it. And it's not the sort of thing that has a singular answer, which is really not so different, frankly, from a lot of what we see in, in ground war. It's just that in ground war, we have actually centuries of established mechanisms, language, ideas, norms, and values. And I'll just leave you one final thought. There's no reason why our core norms and values, which in law of war is to protect civilians above all, uh, there's no reason why those values should not be applicable to the challenges of space, even though the mechanisms of, of of applying them will obviously be different. So thank you so much. Thank you for that thoughtful response, Daniel. Do you think do you see an opportunity to evolve those norms through the lens of thinking about space as a domain conflict? So it's an interesting question whether we need special norms for space mm -hmm. or whether we can use the sorts of norms that have evolved really quite profoundly. I mean, in 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 multiple aspects of managing international affairs, right? So we have all kinds of norms 
and some of them uh some of them we widely recognize i mean getting to the law of war i mean again i, I teach on this and, and it can be kind of technical but some of the core principles are precisely what you would all wish the law of war would do which is to try to make the devastation destruction and purposeful harm of war as focused only on military objectives and on combatants those who who've who've chosen to be part of the process or at least are formally part of the process and trying to protect as much as possible civilians and others who are not on the battlefield say wounded individuals or prisoners of war in any case the core principles might apply well to space, which is how do you minimize the harm to those who are not direct parties to the conflict? That said, there's also, it isn't easy, but we have other norms. We have norms about international business. We have norms about the environment. We have norms about gender. We have all kinds of norms, some of which are enshrined in international legal documents. Some of those documents have enforcement provisions, some don't. International law and international affairs is a, is a huge area. So. So space is so complex, we, we couldn't really imagine a singular uh, mechanism, whether a norm-based mechanism or one that might have enforcement provisions. Um, but but it's, it's a good time to talk about this. But what's tough, of course, and is how do you set those conversations up? How do you guide them? It's actually quite interesting how little have been the advances on space war compared to, say, cyber war. Cyber war, there are a number of, of norms. There are some principles, the Tallinn principles, if you're interested. Um, you know, they may be inadequate, they may be provisional and early in their development, but they are more advanced than, than, than a similar process for what's going on in space today. Because the existing space law really, really came from a different era. It, it made sense at the time, but there were very few players involved in negotiating those issues. Awesome. Thank you so much. Um, as far as I can tell, we didn't get any additional questions. Taryn, can you maybe confirm that, that you didn't field any others? Because if not, then I think we can all tune off. And I want to thank you all so much for being here today. It was great to see your faces and hear about all the great work. Bye. Thank you.